Uh, Horace from Texas. Okay, and I think we've just hit seven o'clock my time, uh, which makes it three p.m. on the East Coast and midday on the West Coast. Uh, I think it's about time we bring on uh, my guest uh, for this evening. Uh, it's Sally Collins. Please, everybody, uh, give her a good welcome. Sally, how are you today? I'm very well, Martin. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not bad at all, considering. Uh, yeah, so uh, it sounds like you're not from the US, but I believe you are on the West Coast right now. Yeah, I am. Australian born, lived in London for a while, and now uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So like you, I've been around. Oh, nice. Well, um, we've got a lot to get on with. So um, I know you have a slide deck there prepared. I'm going to dip off. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to throw them up on the chat. I'll be following along. If something's relevant, I'll post it up for Sally to see. Otherwise, uh, we'll ask you to repost it at the end. Um, there'll be a good Q&A. And uh, if you do miss anything, don't worry. You can replay this video at any time. I'll even make a transcript that I'll be sending people in a few days uh, if you've registered on Eventbrite. Uh, but yeah, if you need anything, Sally, I'll be here. But uh, otherwise, uh, break a leg. Catch you in a bit. All right. Thanks, Martin. So hi, everyone. It's so good to, well, not to see you, but to know that you're out there. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about platform for nonfiction authors. And as I mentioned, I originally am from Australia, worked in publishing there, worked in publishing in London. Uh, there I worked for a book packaging company. So one of my main jobs was to write book proposals. We would pitch them to publishers like St. Martin's Press, Simon & Schuster, back in the day when Barnes & Noble had their own uh, publishing imprint, we would produce books for them as well. So we would pitch the books and then we'd produce them. Then after that, I worked for HarperCollins as an acquisitions editor. So I was on the other side of the desk uh, acquiring from proposals. So I've written them, I've bought them, I've critiqued them, and now I pretty much full-time write them. Uh, a lot of people do not like writing book proposals. They have a reputation. I love them. I love the combination of creativity and the commercial aspect. So today we are, as Martin said, going to be focusing on non-fiction. But I think in this day and age, you know, every author can benefit from what we call platform. So let's plunge in. I'm just going to multitask and get this uh, slide deck going for you. So there's me. I'm Sally Collings. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is four main things. Firstly, what is author platform? You probably have your own ideas, you've heard things, but there are so many definitions, let's cut through that. We're gonna also cut through some of the myths and misconceptions around uh, platform. We're gonna talk about what agents and editors are really looking for. And most importantly, perhaps, we're going to look at how you can start building your platform. So let's kick off with author platform. You know, there are so many definitions floating around. I've pulled up three that for me make some sense. And what I would recommend for you is just to think, you know, what resonates for you? Because above all, you need to be excited about your own platform. <clears throat> Excuse me. So thing one, here's a definition. That plat platform is everything you're doing online and offline to create awareness about who you are and what you do boosting your brand visibility, making it easier and faster for your audience and the wider general public to discover and connect with your brand and books. Now, I like that. That's fairly succinct. Uh, I know some people have some sensitivity or don't really connect with the term brand. So let's move on and look at something, another way of looking at platform. So platform, simply put, is your visibility as an author, your personal ability to sell books through who you are, the connections you have, and various media outlets. And that might be social network, it might be blogs. So the thing that might stick with some people there is the idea that you need to sell books because a lot of people will say, isn't that the job of the publisher? We'll get to that. So here's a third definition of author platform. I like this one because Jane Friedman is amazing and very, very clued into publishing. And this is succinct. It's an ability, an ability to sell books because of who you are or who you can reach. Simple. So here's how I like to think about it. Platform is the foundation under your book. It's all the people holding you up. It's you collecting people. So 
let's look at it this way. The platform is partly a personal thing. It's what you are doing, but it's also how people are getting their eyes on the subject that you're writing about. So you might say that you're writing about eating disorders. So part of your platform is all of the websites, the community discussion boards, the magazines, the articles that talk about eating disorders. But more pointedly, it's how you are talking about eating disorders, whether you're commenting on someone's blog post, writing blog posts yourself, running a podcast, writing articles, talking at your local library or health centre. It's all of those things. So, you know, it's very much to do with people. So platform is part of your book proposal, of course. This is what it kind of comes back to for me because I'm all about the book proposals, but it's also an enduring uh, activity that I think was, was it Marilyn from California? I'm sure you can uh, attest to this, that the activity around promoting your book and getting it in front of people, it never ends. You know, the book is released. That's when, you know, a large part of the activity begins. So, uh, it is an important part of your book proposal. It goes by different names. So if you look at a book proposal, you might see a section in there called author platform, or you might see a section called uh, marketing and publicity or marketing plan or author promotion. Those are all different ways of referring to kind of the same concept. It's all of the th things that, the, that come from the author's side as opposed to the publisher's side. So when you're thinking about your book proposal, you know, for me, the book proposals I write are for nonfiction books. Uh, they tend to run anywhere between 40 and 80 pages long. They seem to get longer and longer every year as agents expect a little bit more. But you should expect that your platform section should run between two and five pages. You know, I've seen it run 20 pages if people have a whole lot of activity that they want to talk about. I think if, if you've got that much to say, probably just hit the highlights in five pages and just say that you have a more detailed plan available on request uh, so that you give enough information that it's clear that you know what you're doing and you're doing it, uh, but not so much that the agent drowns in it. Uh, if you only have a page worth to say, I would suggest you need to work up some more author platform activity. That's perhaps the litmus test. If you only have a page, you maybe need to be doing more. So let us take a look at some of the myths and misconceptions. I've got five just to kick us off here. So first, if a book is well written, platform doesn't matter. So think about the millions of books that already exist. I often make the comment that there's too many books in the world, but there's always space for another good one. Your book needs to be findable amongst all of those millions of books. And that's what your platform helps with. It helps your readers find you. So you might have great credentials, which means you have a well-written book. But if no one outside of your immediate academic or professional circle has never heard of you, again, people just can't find you um, and they can't connect with you. You know, people need to feel that they are connected with you so that they'll shell out 20 bucks for your book or 30 quid or whatever it might be. Um, you probably know yourself that if you read an article about an author, you, you get engaged with the idea and you're more inclined to go and buy their book. And for agents and editors, uh, a platform shows that you're already connected with your readers. You know who they are. You know what they're interested in. This isn't theoretical. You know these people. So that's myth one. Myth two, your publisher will build your platform. So yes, your publisher will put work into promoting your book, usually very short term, usually just within the month that your book is released, unless you hit a bestseller, in which case it will be more enduring. Your publisher will also do very specific things and what they will do depends on the publisher uh, their size, their scale, their, their own approach. But you can expect them to do things like create promotional materials. So, for example, they might send out advanced reading copies of your book. 
uh, trade advertising, placing your book in uh, publishing catalogues. They might do some online marketing, putting out blasts through their own social media. Uh, they may pay for online advertising or specialised promotions. So if your book is in a subject area of, I don't know, woodworking, they may uh, back some of the connections to groups within that interest area. Uh, trade publicity, so presenting your books at trade shows. So those are the kinds of areas that your publisher has an expertise and will back you up. But as I say, it's short term and there is a whole other section of author activities that you can and should be doing. So myth number three, this is, this is my favourite, building a platform is a burden. Now, because you're sitting here participating in this webinar, that might be something that you feel. You might feel that this is just hard work. I would really like you to flip that thinking on its head and think about platforms, see it differently, see it as your litmus test for your book. Are you excited to talk about that book? Do you want to be connecting with people and talking about the subject? Or do you feel a little bit cringy when if, if someone was to introduce you as the author of this book, would that be something you feel proud of and excited by? Do you want to be talking about the subject? You know, use your, the ideas about platform to test these things out. I recently was working with an author and she said to me, look, she had a book in the, the, the kind of spirituality self-help space. And she said, look, I don't feel comfortable with walking in a room and saying, I have written a book about Korean philosophy. What I do feel comfortable with is saying, I've written a book about mindfulness, drawing on my Korean heritage. It's a different spin, but it needed to be something that she felt excited to talk about. Same for you. If you feel like it's a burden, try to flip the thinking on its head. So myth number four, authors should concentrate on manuscript before platform. Now, this is something that people often ask me as a question. They say, should I be doing my manuscript first or working on my platform first? To which my answer is yes, you should do both. They should, there should be a synergy there, a confluence. So if you have set yourself six months to write your manuscript or a year, maybe you need to stretch that timeline out so that you can be working on your platform at the same time. See it as a way, though, to hone your voice, to uh, test out ideas and see what readers and listeners are interested in. See it as complementary to the manuscript, not an extra thing that you have to do. And then myth number five is platform is all about social media. Well, no, and we'll see this in a moment. The platform has many planks. Social media is one. If that is where you hang, you spend your time, you feel comfortable, you know, you're halfway there, especially if you're already talking about the topic of your book. That's part of what you're, the platform that you've already got happening. If you hate social media and think it's a time suck, uh, it, that may not be the place where you need to be spending your time. There are plenty of other places. Uh, all I would ask is that you give it serious consideration before discarding the idea of, uh, being engaged in social media for your book and for your author platform. So what are agents and editors looking for when we talk about author platform? Now, I've got a line there. They're not looking for just high in the sky. What they want to know is that you are going to be an energetic partner in the pursuit of getting your book in people's hands. Uh, I like to think of pu the publisher and the author as a partnership, you know, that you're both contributing to this common goal that you have of making your book a huge success that many, many people will read. So the secret of a great author platform, certainly in the view of agents and editors, is not that you tick every box on the list of activities, but that you're engaged in a few solid ways of connecting right now. And you have a way of knowing how you're going to ramp that up once your book uh, becomes a reality. So you need to do that by showing that your ideas are not just pie in the sky. So, for example, saying that uh, when I get a publishing contract, 
I will blog regularly. No, nah, that won't cut it. Agents and editors want to hear that you have a blog. Uh, here, here are the numbers. Here are how many people subscribe to it. Here are how many people engage with it. Um, and that you are going to ramp that up and maybe provide a particular uh, perspective, maybe through competitions and so forth, when your book exists. So they're looking for uh, clear ideas, clear future plans, statistics and figures are great. So there's a difference between the statistics that are important and valid and the ones that just smell a bit of BS. So it's a little bit like saying that your book will appeal to every woman aged between 35 and 50. Well, no, they're not all going to buy it. That may be your demographic, it's, but it's too sweeping. So in terms of platform, uh, if you're writing about diabetes, let's say there are 16 million adults living with diabetes. I'm pulling these figures out of the air a little bit. That's your demographic. Your platform is that you have 15,000 people subs who subscribe to your newsletter about diabetes. So those kinds of specific numbers that relate to what you are doing that are provable. Uh, so if someone asks, you know, show me a screenshot of your, you know, subscriber list, you can do that. Uh, those are the kind of figures that agents and editors are looking for. So let me see. The next question is, how much is enough? Do I have to have huge social media numbers to impress agents and editors? So everyone will say different figures here. Uh, last month, I was at the San Francisco Writers Conference, uh, listening to agents talk and presenting some of my own projects there. Uh, one of the agents there this year said he wanted to see 50,000 hits a month on an author's website before he would get excited. Another agent told me that she wants to see 10,000 subscribers on an email list and 1,000 followers on Twitter. Hey, but that was in 2017 and that was one agent. Point is, everyone will say things, say somewhat different figures, but then, what substantial, uh, let's, let's talk specifics. One of the things to know is that it depends whether you're talking about uh, memoir, which I'm sure many of you are working on memoir. That is one end of the spectrum where platform is not quite as important. Your writing uh, expertise is probably the most important thing. On the other end of the spectrum, business books really require a very large, solid, engaged audience. So the numbers are slippery. Um, certainly in the Q&A, we can talk some more specifics. Uh, so moving on to how to start building your platform. And I've got a note there, focus on now and focus on the future. So we all need a platform, no matter what publishing model you use. And this is something to mention that whether you're looking to publish independently or whether you're looking for a traditional publishing deal, you need a platform. So uh, there is no cookie cutter answer, but I have for you a list of 14 channels that are useful to consider in your author platform that you can start to build now if you're not already building them. So it's a list of 14. Do not try and do all of them. If you have three of these well and truly tackled, then you're in a good place. So let's have a look at this list. Facebook page likes. So if you are on Facebook, uh, if you have a page for your, either for your book or for you as an author, I like to keep it separate from my personal page because I'm going to be talking about different things. Uh, you don't need to have a completed book to have an author page. You can start to post content that gets followers involved and engaged. Uh, you can invite your readers to bring another, bring along other readers. You can run contests. You can run polls. You can start discussions. Anything that will get people engaged in your topic. Online groups are another useful author platform. More and more authors are using groups 
instead of Facebook author pages. They feel more interactive. They're a great way to have discussions around a topic. Many people who run courses will uh, include uh, or run a Facebook group as part of the course. Uh, so, and I'm going to talk about online courses in a moment more specifically, but that is a great idea. It again helps you to learn more about your readers and what really interests them because they'll tell you. Instagram followers. So if your target audience is younger or your subject lends itself to a visual treatment, Instagram is where it's at. Uh, almost two thirds of its users are under 30 and they definitely are very active in sharing what they like there. Pinterest, similarly, if your uh, project is something that's very visual, so it might be uh, particularly lifestyle, like travel, craft, cooking. Uh, Pinterest, I believe, leans very much towards uh, females uh, and people there are very active, again, in archiving and sharing the things they like. So make sure you're you know, regularly getting images up on Pinterest if that suits your idea, your, your book. LinkedIn. This is, for me, one of the most important places to connect because this is where business people are. So for me, a lot of my work is with consultants, business founders, uh, business executives. So uh, I find LinkedIn is the place to be. It's the community for business professionals. Um, it's expanded so you can write articles, you can post videos. Uh, an important thing with all of this social media is that you can very easily uh, cross promote things. So you can use uh, platforms like Hootsuite uh, to post in multiple channels. YouTube. Uh, YouTube is the second most popular search engine. There's more than 2 billion people using YouTube. Now, a lot of authors will think, well, video is not so much my thing. I've started to use it a lot. I just use small videos to post an idea about the thing I'm talking about, knowing that people gravitate towards video. Uh, it gets me comfortable with talking in front of a screen like I'm doing now. Um, and it meets people where they are. So if I create a short video, I'm going to be putting it up on YouTube. I'm going to be posting it to LinkedIn. I'm going to be posting it to my Facebook author page. So I do one thing and post it to all of those channels. Um, and I just keep track of, you know, how many people are looking at it. I find that LinkedIn gets the most looks and responses for me, but it may well be different for you uh, depending on your demographic. Uh, Twitter followers, similarly, if you're a tweeter, a tweeter, a twitterer, if you already do it, uh, use it for your, your book to, to start talking about the ideas that are important to you. Now, if you're self-publishing, you're going to be looking for quality. You're going to be looking for Twitter followers, and this is true of most social media, who are engaged, having conversations with you. If you're hoping to get a contract with a traditional publisher, you are looking more to build numbers, which can be, you know, a, a challenge because you may be tempted to look at platform building services. What you want is authentic uh, followers who will be interested in your ideas. Uh, bots tend not to be enduring followers who engage with you. So, and there are actually some uh, tools like Twitter audit that will help you filter out the bots and auto followers that you, you're accumulating along the way. We all do. We just click on to the next. So that's seven out of 14. Eight, what's coming up? Eight, email list and newsletter subscribers. So how many email addresses do you have? Um, a regular email newsletter is a great way to keep your topic in front of the people that you're connected with. You know, we all have a lot, that, well, too much that appears in our inbox. But if you provide an email newsletter, once a week, once a month, that's on point, short, pithy, interesting. That's a way to engage with people. Uh, there are tools like MailChimp that will help you to set up a newsletter quickly and easily. Um, so this is a great way to get your ideas in front of people, make it useful so it's not always promoting. You know, again, that's true of all of your platform activity, that 
although you may be doing it because you, you want to build a platform, get a book deal, sell books. People want to know that you're authentic and you're interested in engaging in these ideas. So blog is an obvious channel. I would say if you are a prolific writer and you know you're going to do it regularly, blog is great. If you're going to be sporadic about it, consider deeply whether it's really the right thing to do. I personally don't blog. I do like to guest blog. I like to be a guest occasionally uh, and get in front of other people's audiences because it's a way of cross fertilizing and just talking to people that aren't already listening to me. Online courses is one of my uh, new favorite things. Uh, it's very easy these days to run an online course. There are platforms like Teachable that will enable you to set up the course. It'll look great. Uh, you can create video or not if you want. You can do slide shares uh, and they will also help you with ideas about promoting it. Again, if you run an online course, people subscribe. You could do it free or pay. Um, you are starting to engage with people and just hearing how they respond to the ideas that you have. Speaking engagements is an obvious one. If you're not, well, if you are comfortable with speaking to a live audience, this is, this is something that agents and editors love because their first thought is back of the room sales, by which they mean uh, selling the book at the engagements. Uh, sorry, pause while I look at my notes. Um, something that agents and editors will be looking for is specific. So if you say that you are active on the speaking circuit or anything like that, they will want to know how many speaking engagements you've done in the past year, how many you have booked in for the next year, how many people on average attend each event, and therefore cumulatively how many people you're talking to in the course of a year. So you need numbers for all of this. Influential contacts. Who are you? Do you have famous friends? Because they're gold. If you have some people who are influential and they may be big, you know, household names, that would be great. Um, or they may just be influential in the particular sphere that you're working in. If you can get a testimonial, a promise of a forward, in particular, if you can get more than just a promise, if you can get uh, someone who is well known in the area that you're writing in, to write something about you and your book, even though it doesn't exist yet. They can say something like, you know, Sally Collins is a font of expertise on this particular area. I can't wait for her book to come out. If it's someone that is impressive, agents and editors are going to like that a lot. Industry leadership. You know, maybe it is worthwhile to be uh, president of your local chamber of commerce or the state representative for uh, the Woodworkers Guild. Did I already mention woodworking? I, I don't know why. Um, so this only not only reinforces your expert, expert status, it means that you're building loyalty within that community. Uh, people, if you are uh, in a leadership position, uh, those industry groups will support by putting out the word about your book. They may even buy copies of it. So all of these things are helpful. Last but not least, media interviews. You know, media coverage is, of course, great. If you can write and place articles, either in trade, regional, national, any publications, this is great. The bigger, the better. But remember, you don't have to be the one that writes the article. You know, you can offer yourself as an expert to comment on areas. There is a service called Help a Reporter Out, H-A-R-O. Harrow? I don't know if you say it that way. Uh, but that's a great secret weapon for securing media interviews. It's a free subscription service that journalists use when they're looking for experts to talk on a particular or to be interviewed on a particular topic. So that's a way that you can connect with journalists to become the go-to person in your subject area. Whew. So there's 14 channels you can build now. So 14 is a lot. If you can cover three of those, if three of those are things that you feel comfortable uh, delving into and engaging in, that's great. So, oops, let me just flick through to the next. So 
Split it down into what you're doing now and what you can and will develop in the future. Think about now, think about future. Uh, talk it up. So in talking about the platform in your book proposal, lead with your best ideas. Uh, consider other topics, surprising topics, the celebrity support, blog tours, which is the, the same as a book tour but online, uh, going around other blogs and appearing as a guest. Serialisation. Are there extracts from your book that could lend themselves to serialisation, either in large magazines or specialist magazines? Podcasts. Do you have one? Should you have one? Can you appear as a guest on a podcast? Uh, collateral. If you have the skills to create collateral around your book, that's a great idea. So if you are a designer and you can come up with postcards, bookmarks, posters, if, you're, if you have the skills or the resources to create videos, that's great. I just, the time is ticking away, so I'm going to move on to the last section, which is some extracts from some real book proposals that sold to agents and to publishers. So here's three that I've worked on recently. I've stripped out the identifying details uh, just to preserve my client's anonymity. So first is a business author. So this author is an ex expert in sales. So in his book proposal, he said that he delivers about 70 speeches, seminars, webinars, presentation in the previous year on the topics to be covered in the book. That's really important because if you currently speak, as another client of mine does, uh, this other client is a jewellery designer. He speaks about jewellery, wanted to write a book about uh, professional development, but his audience didn't want to hear him talk about that. They wanted the jewellery. So make sure it's that your speaking is relevant to the topic in your book. So my business author promised that he does 70 speeches a year. Uh, his website has just over 100,000 active subscribers. Uh, his company has two websites and they get 25,000 visitors per month each. Uh, he was able to promise that he has a company e-newsletter that reaches just over 58,000, as well as specific tip newsletters. Uh, so the total reach there was 74,500 people. So for a business author, emphasising that, those are great numbers, those are great activities. Uh, it, within his organisation, he has many people contributing articles each year, which is an opportunity to promote the ideas of his book. So example number two is a natural beauty author. So this person is all about television and, and that media form of publicity. So first promise is that he has a publicist uh, to aggressively pursue publicity opportunities. I don't like the word aggressively, but hey, it gets the message across. Uh, he has a very active, very successful blog with 15 million page views, the most read blog by a plastic surgeon in the United States. Um, side note, plastic surgeon, natural beauty, not sure about that. Anyway, um, so he was able to provide a demo reel and clips to the many televised appearances on his YouTube channel. So if you're providing something like article demonstrations of your platform, make sure you put links in your, uh, in your book proposal. This author had a great collection of influencers who he knew or could tap for uh, support. So Rachel Ray, Dr Oz, the list went on. It was an amazing list. So that was front and centre because that's gold. Example number three, a personal development author. Now, again, this was quite a corporate audience. This author had an interesting promise or offer for the publisher that he would run a two-day workshop for their executive editors and marketing team so they could capture the essence of their work uh, and benefit from it. Interesting. I like it. Uh, they promised to launch a website for the book and had some very specific resources and various ideas. Uh, my only doubt about this point is that it's a little bit promisey, could be pie in the sky. However, 
uh, they already have a very active corporate website. They could have made more of that in this in this section, uh, but they make it clear that they know how to adapt what they're currently doing to accommodate the uh, the needs of the book itself. And an email list of close to sixteen thousand. Um, they had some great ideas about pre-selling it, offering bonuses, limited time deals, and so forth. There's so much to say. I'm going to wrap it up there. Have fun, you know, because the author platform needs to be very personal. Uh, people can tell if you're having fun with it. Martin, um, have we got questions that we need to address? Uh, yeah, well, they're going to be coming in. So I know a load, load of folks have been uh, asking questions throughout. If you could post it again, it'll just make it so much easier for me to find. Um, while we wait for that to come in, uh, Sally, I know you're a, uh, a professional on the Reedsy marketplace. Uh, if people want to work with you, what sort of things uh, can, can you do to help them? Okay, so my, my thing is book proposals. Uh, so I can write a complete book proposal for someone. Not everyone needs the whole thing written, though. So I am very happy to customise what I offer to meet people with what they need. In particular, I like to offer bundles of 10 hours of my time uh, to work up their book concept. So what I do with that is we have several conversations. I draft material. I do research on uh, the, the, the competing titles. I look into what's there. I basically act as cheerleader, critique, whatever it is that people need. So that's a great place to start working with me is just to book a bundle of bundle of hours to work up their book concept. Cool. And I'm going to post uh, Sally's profile uh, link just there in the comments just there. As I mentioned, uh, we'll be sending this around as a transcript in a few days. Uh, so if you missed the link here, don't worry, we're going to have it in that one. Uh, okay, one of the first questions I think, I think we've seen in a few different ways uh, about people talking about blogs. Um, the idea is like, do we need a blog? What do we put in it? Like, they know they have one on their website. Um, you know, what, what should they be blogging about? Uh, look, I think this is where it needs to be relevant to your book. So it's a little bit hard to pin down an exact answer on that. You know, one thing that is very popular to do, of course, is to blog your book. So literally plan out the 10, 15 chapters that you're going to have in your book and start to write up blog posts on each of those topics. That's kind of, although I don't recommend that you think of it as literally uh, the posting the chapters online, I think there's a great space there for, you know, if, if chapter one is... Uh, helping your child deal with a diagnosis of a health problem, write it as a blog post and just see, and that might only be a thousand words as opposed to a full chapter, but it's a great way to test out how you're going to write about this, what your voice is and how people respond to it. Uh, yeah, I'd sort of say uh, one of the things that people, when they come to us, if they're doing, you know, they're nonfiction authors, chances are that, you know, something in their book will be aimed at helping people do something. They're an authority in something. So to use your woodworking example, you know, if you're putting out a woodworking book, you can easily talk about, you know, woodworkers you see, you know, blog about woodworking videos you see. Uh, you know, you could post about anything you're working on currently. There's, you know, a real font of, of content that you can create that people will search for. You know, mm. once you sort of blog about it, you can post it in your groups, your online groups, and then you can start getting traction. Because all the other things you've mentioned before between the newsletter and being in the groups, unless you have something to share or something to say, it's going to be hard to get any traction in those. And so for us, having a blog and, and a home for all, all this content you can create becomes quite, quite helpful. Mm, uh, I think Gladys asked this question again. I'm just going to answer it briefly, maybe. What is the difference between a blog uh, and a web page or website? Okay, so I, th I think of a, a web page or a website as uh, kind of your online home. Now, it could be quite static. It might just be about you. Uh, it might describe you. It might describe your ideas. It might include uh, links to articles or links to other sites that you find helpful. A blog is a bit more dynamic. It's a little bit like a, a magazine component within your web page. So often you might have a web page and you can choose whether or not to, to have a blog component in it. So web page, I mean, you could put up a web page and it could stay the same for a year. 
Uh, a blog is more dynamic. You know, a blog is the kind of thing that you're writing new content for uh, probably every week. Uh, and it's constantly changing. So sometimes they sit together. Sometimes people just do one or the other. Uh, Charlene asks, uh, well, it might be a tough one to ask. Uh, what is a wise ratio of social posting and blogging to manuscript writing? I guess the, the point is, I, I suppose, if you're still in the writing phase, how much effort you reckon people should be devoting to, to building their platform? Yeah, look, that is a great question. It probably depends on whether you are writing your manuscript as your your side activity or whether it's the your full-time activity so if for example you are fortunate or crazy enough to be a full-time writer uh, i would probably say spend what i say spend three quarters of your time writing the manuscript and one quarter of your time uh posting blogging and doing other activities However, if it's kind of your side hustle, if you've got a full-time job and then you're coming home to write your manuscript, you probably don't have quite as much availability. So that's where you might just think, well, I'm going to spend two hours a week on platform uh, and 10 hours on writing the manuscript. So I think it's a matter of just keeping it in proportion, um, wise ratio, you know, something like that. I think yeah, if it's, if it's your full-time activity, 75% uh, writing, 25% platform. If it's a side gig, uh, 10 hours writing, two hours platform. Uh, here's a quick one from Tracy Wood. Do agents look at your social media platforms? Yes. In fact, agents look at everything. They will deep Google you. They will be looking at your social media. And this is only, I hasten to add, if they're interested enough, if you have an idea that they think is worthy and they have a, a feeling that you're worth checking out they will be deep googling you they'll be looking at your website your facebook your twitter uh they will just google to see you know do you have any kind of online presence are people following you so yes absolutely they're looking i think yeah there's a lot of people who are mentioning about uh maybe they should get on all the social media platforms but i'm wondering like yeah, does it look worse if you're on all the platforms and like half of them you have very few followers and very little activity? Is it best just to like leave those than to have a, a profile out there that looks a bit sparse? Yeah, look, I would recommend that you just stick to the ones that are your strong suit. You know, I certainly recommend when people are writing book proposals, if you have 200 Twitter followers, Probably don't mean, don't don't include that because it's just such a paltry figure. I don't know that I would go as far as saying shut down your Twitter account, but don't include it as part of your platform in your book proposal. Just pursue the strong the strong points. And likewise with your activity and where you put your energy, put it into your strong suits. Uh, well, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we had a load of uh, fiction writers in here. Stephanie asks, um, what would you blog about for fiction writers? I guess this sort of expands out to pretty much anything in the, uh, the platform building side. Yeah, look, it, it depends very much on the kind of fiction you write. Um, and this isn't my core expertise, but I do know that if people are genre writers, if they're doing romance, fantasy, science fiction, a lot of them get a lot of traction within their own community by writing about writing. So they yeah they're, they're engaged with their genre community writing about their writing um if your writing is more in the way of uh, memoir or literary fiction then there might be particular topics that you would write that you are writing about that you would blog so if your area of interest is i don't know crime or writing about you know family relationships whatever it might be then maybe that's what you blog about uh i guess a tough question that a lot of people have been asking uh um, probably isn't i imagine the answer is depends but what are the top three channels you believe to be the most effective yeah look it, well it, it does depend it depends on you and it depends on your genre so for me you know, because of what I do, a lot of the people, as I mentioned, are in the business world. So for me, LinkedIn is the most powerful uh, channel. Uh, speaking webinars like this are really powerful for me. Uh, but if I were a health writer, 
I would expect that Facebook would be one of my, my secret weapons. Um, if I were writing a, a very strongly how-to book, online courses would be where I would be putting my energy. So it's very specific to your genre and to your comfort zone. You've got to be enthusiastic about it to do it well. Uh, da, 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 da. Ooh, okay. Uh, DM asks, if you have expertise in something else, such as education, and that's the basis of your online presence, does that help you at all? I'm guessing the question is, like, if you, if you are a prominent figure, but it's not necessarily related to the book you're writing, does it help? Uh, I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, it's nice to know that people are looking at you and listening to you. But as a, for instance, I worked with uh, an author last year who was, he had what looked like all of the good stuff. He'd done a TED talk. He contributed to Forbes and Inc. magazines. Uh, he was a, a leader in the tech sphere. But he wanted to write a book about a particular philosophy of, of leadership. And so the agent that I first spoke to said he doesn't have a platform. I said, what do you mean he doesn't have a platform? Ted, Inc., Forbes. But it wasn't relevant. So I would say, uh, yeah, you need to really build. The platform is all about relevance. So, yes, it's nice to know that people are listening to you and that you know how to make a platform. But I think now you need to build a different one. Great. I think that's uh, the last question we have. Thank you so much, uh, Sally. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a link to uh, Sally's profile on Readsy. If you're looking for help uh, with your book proposal, uh, Sally can definitely help you through that. Uh, do you have anything you want to say to the folks uh, before we log off? Oh, look, just again, I'll just say ha have fun, do what feels good, and um, stay well. Okay. Uh, just as a reminder, we have another nonfiction related one. I know. But a lot of you are still authors, but this one is more on the writing side of things. We have uh, Harry Friedman, who's a, a ghostwriter and author in his own right. Uh, he's going to join us and talk about the art of storytelling uh, in nonfiction. When you have uh, quite a dry subject, sometimes you do need to infuse it with some story. So I posted a link for that. Sign up. It's in two weeks' time. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much, Sally, for joining us. It's been incredibly helpful. We'll have that transcript out to you and everyone else in a few days. All right. See you soon, Sally. Okay. Bye. Uh, cheers.